It's recording. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We have a special presentation from the other side of the pond. Jules, would you like to give the background story on why we're having this this morning? This started uh, several years ago as part of a 4,500 mile trip and a 100 mile walk by my daughter and son in law. Uh, they decided to hit the uh, Coxwall Way uh, National Park Trail uh, in England. And along the way, they met a number of people, uh, all of them friendly. And one of them happened to be Peter Range and his wife, Carol. And they were coming to Alaska pre-COVID. So we spent a lot of time talking about where do you go, uh, what time of year, uh, how do you get there? And uh, as a result of that, we were talking photography quite a bit. And it turned out that at that point in time, Peter was program chairman for this club. And I had been chairman. And he said, would I present something on Alaska? Well, I ended up in two presentations to the club. And in return, I asked that they give us something on England at their choice. And that's where we are today, the end of a 400 or a 4,000 mile trip. Take it away. Great. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dave Clark. Uh, I took over from Peter Range as program secretary for the uh, the club here, and uh, it's uh, thank you for the opportunity to sort of present back. Uh, we can't quite rival uh, yourselves and Jules for bears and large fauna, but uh, a group of us got together to have a look at uh, how we could offer you a, a, a sort of road trip along the the western coast uh, of Great Britain. So. Um, Hope it'll be of interest. Uh, given the numbers, uh, do feel free just to leap in and ask questions as we go along. Very happy to uh, answer as we go through. So I'll share screen if that's okay, Margaret. And just, yes, please. Uh, you should be good. Uh, you should be good to go. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys can see the slides. They look good. Okay, great. So. Uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll just um, uh, say a quick thank you to these these members who put some material together. Uh, uh, really, it was quite an interesting experience, sort of trying to give a tour of Britain. And uh, uh, what we decided was to really focus in on some places that, that we knew and loved. And uh, essentially what we're going to do is start in the bottom left-hand corner of this small island, uh, off the coast of Europe, in a way, um, we uh, we're going to sort of go up uh, through Wales, the Lake District, uh, up into Scotland, and we're going to sort of look at sort of three areas in Scotland, uh, mainly landscapes, but with a little bit of detour on some wildlife and a little bit on architecture, and hopefully some interesting new comments about some of the history and how you know five thousand years of human occupation has has really shaped. Uh, the landscape. Um, uh, there are a few wild areas left in, on the island, uh, but nowhere near uh, the same type of wilderness that uh, you guys have got access to. So let me start at the bottom left, uh, as it were, southwest England, and, and start with Cornwall. Um, Cornwall's the sort of the left hand side of this uh, little map down at the bottom left hand corner. Uh, in many ways, for for I would say a lot of the 20th century, Cornwall was seen pretty much as a backwater. The, the industrial heyday of mining had gone and the fishing industry was pretty quiet. Um, and it's always had romantic uh, associations with uh, smuggling, uh, the wrecking uh, thing where families would put fake lights up and call a ship in uh, onto the rocks on the coast. And you'll see just how dramatic the coast can be. Um, in the early 20th century, it's really, and sorry, 21st century, it's really become a, a dominated by tourism, second home ownership and such like, and that's introduced uh, its own problems. It's not very big. Um, and uh, I'll show you some of the, the typical landscapes of the area. Um, of course, everyone knows Land's End, it's the end point. Uh, uh, 
and New York's 3,000 miles over the, over the Atlantic, uh, and John O'Groats, which everyone thinks of as the sort of the top right of Great Britain, in fact, it's not quite, um, is, uh, is, you know, almost 900 miles uh, north, uh, northeast of it. Um, and that's really what Land's End looks like. It's, it's not very dramatic. It's just literally the, the end of the main island of Britain. Uh, but of course, the, the coast is very dramatic and uh, a lot of the history uh, of uh, Cornwall's associated with mining. The Romans did mining, uh, you know, there's uh, two, three thousand years of mining history in the area. And a lot of the remnants of the old mines are still there, very dramatic, as, as you can see here. Uh, and certainly for someone who was brought up in Britain, you know, you think of Cornwall, we think of the mining industry, uh, we think of tin, a little bit of silver, uh, very little gold, unfortunately. Um, but it's uh, pretty well sums up uh, what uh, the major industrial uh, uh, sign was, oh, sorry, the main uh, industry was for a long time. Uh, of course, the coast is very beautiful. You've got a spring flowers coming up uh, over at Kynan's Coast. Th these coves are places that member, our members in the club, uh, Mike Woolacott here, uh, particularly like, and he always returns to them. Um, and you can see on a sunny day, it's just a very beautiful place uh, to be. Uh, there's another look, uh, the same uh, cove, beautiful water, and uh, it sort of really justifies Cornwall as a sort of main tourist uh, destination. Family beach holidays, it's, uh, those of us who are sort of living in the southwest, you know, every couple of years, most people do go down to Cornwall for the holidays. Uh, a lot of kayaking, a lot of water sports. But of course, the, the coast is quite dramatic as well. And uh, there are a number of uh, interesting places where you can get uh, very atmospheric evening shots. Uh, this is one of um, Ray Grace's uh, long exposures. Uh, just from Port Nanvan, one, one of the areas down there. Um, and it's a, a very uh, photogenic area, uh, but it does get incredibly crowded over the summer, so you've got to pick your times. There's still a little bit of uh, fishing industry going on. Uh, uh, the, the main uh, ship, uh, fishing industry, of course, is long, long changed into massive uh, offshore boats, and, but the local industry is still there. Uh, and there are a lot of these small coves and small fishing villages with their piers built a couple of hundred years ago uh, to protect the, the landing place for the small craft. There are, of course, a few sort of uh, signature places, St. Michael's Mount uh, at Marizon. Uh, one of the things about Cornwall is that uh, there is a Cornish language. It's a little bit related to Breton. It's another one of the Celtic variants, um, a little bit like Gaelic. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the local produce for black pudding and fishing, uh, pickling and all that sort of stuff, there's quite a strong connection between Cornwall and the north coast of France. And uh, as I've said, uh, certainly there was a, um, a long standing battle between the customs and excise men and the uh, smugglers in the area. Uh, I think uh, most of the French brandy was illegally imported into <laughs> England from uh, through Cornwall for a long time. Uh, few hundred years ago but you can see how beautiful the, the coast can be um, and it's still very much lived there there are some holiday homes on, on St Michael's Mount but also a lot of locals uh, live there um, very typical uh, summer's day now one of the things about the dramatic coast is of course the the tourists are, are well provided for and Minak theatre is one of these places where they actually hold uh, in a, a sort of man-made amphitheater, uh, theatrical productions, uh, music performances and such like. And uh, for those of you who like uh, theater and especially outdoor theater, some of the performances here can be quite amazing. Um, you know, sort of steeply raked seats, uh, very small sites. And of course the background is incredible if you get the right production. St. Ives is one of the sort of the main towns. It's, uh, it's still got a remnant of the, the fishing industry and, and boating. Um, 
and there's a, a biggish harbour there. But uh, again, one of the things, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, is that there's been a lot of money pumped into Cornwall to rejuvenate the area. Um, Tate Modern is uh, one of the main uh, uh, new museums, art museums down there. And it's a fascinating building, multi-layered, set into the hill. Um, and also one of the other interesting uh, sort of tourist places locally is the Eden Project. This was the work of one man who bought up an old quarry and built biodomes um, and essentially has set up a sort of almost, not quite a survivalist thing, but a, uh, essentially recreating uh, environments from around the world and regrowing rare plants and such like. Um, it still struggles, I think. It's a long, long way from main uh, urban areas, so it's a... You know, it's an epic couple of days trip really uh, to it, but it's quite fascinating. Uh, they're actually growing, uh, you know, rare plants and keeping uh, gene lines going uh, for them while trying to make it a tourist attraction, which is a, an interesting conundrum. The Lizard Peninsula is sort of the bottom part of Cornwall. And again, you can see here uh, the, the two things that are sort of uh, uh, very common there's the big lighthouse and then there's the uh, slipway for the uh, lifeboats uh, and most of the lifeboats are run by amateur crews uh, and incredibly brave people given the uh, nature of the storms and, and rocky shoals in the area uh, been some amazing rescues over the years but uh, if you sort of wanted to know what a typical point sticking out to the sea in, in Cornwall was looked like it will have a lighthouse and it will have a, a, a Royal Naval, uh, sorry, um, uh, RLNI uh, lifeboat station uh, with its typical slipway. Now, as you move into the, along the coast back towards sort of the, the rest of Britain, you uh, come across uh, the moors. These are only probably four or 500 uh, yards high over sea level. Um, they're not particularly high, um, but they were really wind blasted and uh, uh, Ray's a big fan of infrared and uh, he's done a lot of work on capturing some of the old tin mines, uh, not just on the coast, but also in, in the, on the moors as well. Um, and one of the other things that becomes very clear is once you get onto the the moors, and this is Dartmoor, which is slightly to the east of uh, Cornwall, uh, you start coming across the Neolithic uh, stone monuments. And it's a, you've got to hear a nice sort of juxtaposition between the, the three to 5,000 year old stone uh, monument uh, and the uh, one of the other uh, tin mines stuck uh, on the horizon. Um, this was uh, one of Ray's uh, infrared era uh, photos, but I think it's quite a nice summary of this old and new. And one of the things you'll see as we go through, there are stone circles um, prevalent across all the areas we're going to talk about. Uh, and some of them are five, 6,000 years old. So uh, Britain's been occupied for a long time. Sorry, there was just a question in chat. Oh, thank you. Um, let me. Uh, sorry, let me just get rid of this uh, chat thing. Sorry, folks. I seem to have pressed on the uh, the chat function, and it's there. You go. Right. So, and as you go further. Oh, done it again. Uh, and as you go further east, um, you end up in uh, the next county along, um, and Heartland Quay. Uh, again, uh, you've got a cormorant uh, on the top left there, uh, sitting on the rocks. But again, you can see the rocks formations are different, but not uh, so different. And again, uh, with the long exposure, you get this very atmospheric uh, look on the, um, the sea and the rocks. So let's head up to Wales. Uh, uh, Wales is sort of uh, to the north, just north of um, uh, the out, outpost down towards Cornwall. Um, 
it was one of the first when England and Wales essentially became the same legal entity back, I don't know, 12, 1300s. Um, uh, Wales is really split in two. The, the southern part is the historically very industrial part and the north has always been uh, very much Welsh speaking, uh, very much different. Um, and the culture's been uh, maintained even to modern day. Uh, they, they do feel not quite different countries, but they, they do feel different. So we're based near Bristol, uh, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner here, just north of there. Um, and of course, Wales and Southern Wales in particular is quite a, a common place for us to go off and do our photo uh, hobby. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of going westwards along the main east west road on the South Wales up and take a few detours up into the Brecon Beacons, which are the uh, shown here and then we'll go up the coast a bit up to Snowdonia and then uh, out of Wales. So as we go up towards Wales you know it's uh, Wales is there here on the far side of the north shore of the Bristol Channel so even in uh, as you come up towards Bristol from where we were before um, you can look out towards Wales across the Bristol Channel and uh, here you have one of the old uh, piers down at Western Supermare, which was a, a sort of a Victorian uh, ooh, holiday resort, I suppose, uh, but a very typical of what happens. The piers are, are built uh, in the 1800s. They, they go through multiple changes, often major fires, and some are left derelict, some are left uh, uh, still functioning, um, but often a little bit of an eyesore, even if they are quite photogenic. Um, there are two main road bridges uh, that link England and Wales. Here's the new one. Uh, and uh, nice suspension bridges. And there's a very nice uh, sort of uh, set of viewpoints. You just go uh, north of Bristol, uh, head towards the Severn River, and you get uh, beautiful sunsets like this one. Uh, if you go a bit further north, you can see both bridges here, the old bridge in front and the new bridge that you've just seen behind. Um, this was a, a not very pleasant uh, summer's day. And one of the interesting things that we'll sort of echo as we go through, um, uh, a lot of the coast here is, was in the 60s, uh, was the site of building of a couple of nuclear power stations. So occasionally you get these ugly block buildings uh, and you can see part of one here just uh, in silhouette against the bridges. Um, these are the old uh, nuclear power stations now decommissioned or being decommissioned, I should say. Um, and as you go further west, you find these beautiful uh, cliffs. Uh, this is uh, obviously sunset coming in uh, in the far west. And we're just sort of looking uh, westwards uh, along Nash Point, a uh, very typical coastal scene. Uh, if you go and maybe five, 10 miles further on round the bend and you'll end up in industrial uh, site with one of the old steelworks, for example. Uh, but there's still some very beautiful uh, coastal areas along the way. Now, if you take a slight detour off the main roads as you go west, uh, you can go into Raglan Castle. Um, this is one of the interesting things about Wales, is, of course, it was a border area. Um, and uh, Raglan had been built and rebuilt for many times. Um, and the, uh, this one was ruined in the uh, English Civil War uh, in the 1600s. Um, again, most of the castles we'll see uh, uh, were essentially local power strongholds and uh, ruined in one or other of the eras of conflict. Uh, and uh, the civil, English Civil War really tore uh, England apart. Um, spreading into Wales uh, everywhere. Now, if you sort of go a little beyond Raglan, maybe 10, 15 miles, you end up in places, uh, this is the Big Pit National Coal Museum. Uh, this one was taken during lockdown and there was literally nobody around. But one of the things, of course, about South Wales is it was famous as one of the main sources of the coal, of coal uh, for Britain and uh, the valleys were totally dominated by the coal industry uh, which is now shut uh, for good reasons and uh, 
but the remnants, the almost the decaying industrial remnants are, are not very far off the main roads. You don't have to take very far uh, off the roads and you see all sorts of uh, decaying pit equipment and slow reclamation of the land. Of course, in contrast, you get these beautiful waterfalls. Um, uh, Wales is uh, subject to a lot of rain um, and the waterfalls in particular are great photo opportunities. And again, these are literally 10, 15 miles uh, off the main road, uh, heading west, just nip out in towards the Brecon Beacons. Uh, and you find all of these uh, series of waterfalls is a classic uh, look from somewhere. This is one of Ray's, I think. Um, now, the Brecon Beacons, as I showed on the map, is a sort of the hilly area right in the heart of uh, South Wales, and it's pretty desolate, uh, quite dangerous walking in bad weather. Um, and Penny Fan is the highest peak in South Wales. It's not high, uh, much of a peak compared to the mountains you guys get, but uh, it's a pretty challenging walk in bad weather. And uh, most people don't do it without some preparation, serious preparation. Um, this is a sort of typical look. Um, and there's uh, Ray in doing a selfie uh, in the same place. Um, if you carry on west, you sort of, um, it gets wilder and uh, less developed, less industry, uh, smaller towns and villages. And you come across these ruined medieval castles from the era of the England, English conquest of Wales. Um, 12, 1300s. Uh, I thought this one looked particularly Game of Thrones ish. Uh, and uh, it's, it, again, it illustrates just, uh, you know, how many hundreds of years of conflict have sort of shaped the uh, ownership of the land and uh, who gets access to what. When you finally hit the west coast of Wales, this is at St. David's Head, this is the most westerly part of. Uh, uh, Wales, um, you're essentially looking out towards uh, Ireland and across down to the Atlantic. And again, here's a typical uh, picture, the sun going down, uh, surfing on a quiet beach uh, near St. David's Head. It's a very idyllic, perfect holiday place. And in fact, Pembroke, which is the area around St. David's, is really dominated now by um, holiday and uh, tourism uh, rather than any of the local industries that were there. There are signs just uh, for those who are interested, St. David's was where uh, Christianity first arrived in Wales. Um, and there's been, uh, uh, I would say, smaller, in, a fair amount of industry there. In fact, one of the villages just down the, from where this beach is, um, up until about uh, 1915, you could get a, or 1910, I think it was, you could get a sailboat to uh, the USA, one-way tickets for a few shillings on a sailboat and that was where a lot of the emigration from Wales uh, headed out from not the main cities but the small ports along the west coast. Um, Cardigan Bays uh, about halfway up Wales again uh, looking west uh, again a, a nice sunset and again very typical of the the light in fact one of the interesting things about the west coast of Wales is there's quite an artistic community there um, from the 20th century onwards um, a lot of painters like it because of the light uh, it does it is different it's uh, quite fascinating and probably my favorite uh, uh little bird from the the west coast the, the atlantic puffin um uh, this is uh, basically on one of the islands just off uh, the west coast of wales and uh, it landed with a full beak now if we come out of uh sort of the west coast of wales go up you end up uh, basically in some fairly hilly, uh, we would say mountainous, I think you would call them hills. Uh, and the highest mountain in North Wales is around the Snow Snowdon Horseshoe. There, You can see it there in the distance, just hidden, clipped by the cloud. Uh, very typical view of North Wales, uh, stone walls. These are rocks that have people have lifted out of the fields onto the to make the uh, rough walls up to mark the uh, fields off and you can see the wind the trees are not very large and look pretty bent over blasted by the wind and that's a pretty accurate description um snowdonia as an area uh, there was a lot of old mine buildings uh, a lot of old mining work for slate uh, some lead 
uh, a few other um, industries, but a lot of that, a lot of that's now gone, of course. And uh, there's a lot of disused old uh, buildings left, uh, often in poor state of decay and quite dangerous, actually. Uh, some of these now. Uh, the slate miners accommodation and of course uh, uh, the ubiquitous uh, sheep and in fact if anyone really asks you know why does england look or britain look like it does the answer is sheep because it they eat the trees and uh, the natural forest uh, and woods never come back but th this hopefully gives you a view of what north wales looks like on a nice day on a, on a bad weather day it can look pretty horrific very gray and very grim now, one of the interesting things, of course, is that uh, in the 1700s, uh, there was a huge spate of canal building, which sort of coincided with the first uh, agricultural revolution in Britain. And North Wales uh, is riddled with these amazing tunnels and uh, huge construction works, aqueducts. Um, and a lot of the canals are now being brought back into use for tourism, for leisure activities. Uh, by volunteers, local um, not-for-profit organisations. And this is uh, Chirk, which is actually sits on the border between North Wales and um, England. Uh, and this uh, canal actually crosses the boundary, uh, the border. And if you look back from this tunnel, it has a welcome to, welcome to England sign halfway across the water, uh, which is quite funny. Um, but again, hopefully it gives you a flavour of the um, wildness today but actually it's, if you go back a hundred years, 200 years, it was all driven, the local economy was all driven by slate, heavy mining and transportation of goods through uh, tunnels and with the canals rather than the railways. Um, because it worked, but once they built them, they actually still kept them going for quite a while. Uh, but eventually the railways and road took over. So, uh, that's Wales, um, and I think it's interesting. So the Welsh language is still uh, taught in schools, North Wales in particular. Um, of course, you've got the devolved uh, parliament in Wales now. So although it still has the law of England and Wales, the actual political structures are, are diverging slightly. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens as the uh, devolution progresses further. Um, so the Lake District is back in England. Um, Wales is just south of here on the map, you can see. And uh, the, uh, the Lake District is, of course, famous for the um, romantic poets, Beatrix Potter. Um, kids and grandkids uh, uh, are into that um it's a very wet area uh, obviously with the uh, prevailing westerlies coming in um and it's uh, it's always been uh, seen as a very uh, special and quite different place uh to the rest of england simply because of the way in which the the hills and the wet the weather uh interact so here's a, a sort of typical look at what uh, the Lake District looks like. Unlike Wales, which is green, but has much, certainly North Wales is much darker um, stonework. Uh, the, the lakes have been uh, manicured. They've still got the glacial U-shaped valleys everywhere and the, and the higher hills, but you can see here the stone walls where people have actually picked the stones out of the fields to create the walls for the fields. Um, and it's been manicured. It's a lot more mannered than Wales in many ways. It's still very agricultural, a lot of sheep farming. Um, both North Wales and the Lake District were, of course, uh, famously affected by the, the cloud of radionucleotides that came over from Chernobyl. Uh, and there's a whole saga to talk about the problems with hill farming uh, that came from that. But uh, this is a very typical look at what uh, the Lake District looks like. Um, the lakes are used for boating, tourism very much now, a little bit of fishing. Um, and this is, a, again, a rather idyllic uh, look on Ullswater, one of the lakes. Um, 
very typical again, uh, sort of early autumn, um, quite dark skies uh, with the colors, but uh, again, very beautiful, very green. Uh, and Grasmere up from the hills, you can see here the difference between the sort of the manicured fields at the bottom of the glacial valleys and the, um, the much rougher fells on the top, uh, bracken and a few sheep and not much else. Um, but again, this is uh, what people, the romantic poets, were waxing lyrical about uh, uh, for many, many hundreds of years ago, and uh, it's still a major tourist uh, area. Eldwater with a beautiful rainbow and a, one of the glebes, I think. Again, uh, slightly autumny, wintry feel. Um, very photogenic. If you know where you're going and uh, are willing to wait for the light uh, and get up either early or late in the afternoon, you can get some really beautiful uh, landscape images uh, from the lakes. Of course, I mentioned they get a lot of rain. And uh, personally, I, I spent probably, I had an aunt who lived in the Lake District. And as a child, uh, I, all I remember is rain. Uh, every time we went, it absolutely tipped it down. It was uh, not a great place to visit as a kid for me. Uh, and here's a, a really nice uh, image from a, a stormy day on Do and Water. Um, West Water, which is one of the smaller uh, lakes. Uh, in its own little ring of hills. Uh, again, very typical autumn look, um, wispy clouds and the, and the bracken just turning after the summer. As you go higher, of course, you, you get these small stunted trees, again, uh, very much uh, damaged and blasted by the winds uh, on the hillside, and uh, they're lucky to survive, really. And then this gives you a uh, perhaps a, a look at what some of the the rougher walking territory is there are a lot of paths and a lot of people go walking on the on the higher fells as they're called um still with the the fields uh, demarcated using the stone picked out of the, the the land um but you can see how wild and uh, rugged this can be um very challenging walking in, in bad conditions um, But of course, uh, you've got these uh, beautiful little lakes as well, uh, even in amongst the roughest areas. So a tarn is a local name uh, for a, a, a lake. Uh, a lot of the names and, and language from the northwest of England uh, has, has, a, has its own history and a lot of it's, uh, some of it's influenced by Viking, um, but a lot of it is uh, uh, a little bit of a, a uh, influence from Scotland as well. So it's, it's a very uh, interesting mix of languages uh, or language influences, I should say. But Blee Tarn in Langdale is uh, rather beautiful. Um, and again, these tarns are uh, essentially geological features. They're, they're um, quarries, I think they're called in uh, glaciology, and then dug out by the uh, glacier as it feeds into the valley below. And then when it retreats, as it has done over thousands of years, obviously it leaves a pool of water at the top of the valley and forms these tarns or small lakes. Again, I, I rather like this one, nice leading lines, and it's a very uh, peaceful scene. I mentioned earlier, we saw one of the uh, stone uh, uh, Neolithic uh, buildings, or buildings or constructions anyway, down in uh, Cornwall um, or towards Cornwall. Uh, Castle Rig Stone Circle is a uh, pretty big uh, miniature stone hinge, as it were, uh, in the lakes. And uh, this is uh, captures it nicely. It sort of sits in a um, the flat glacial U, U valley uh, with the hills around it. Um, it's a few hundred yards across. Um, still somewhat mysterious as to what it was there for. Astronomical may, uh, forecaster, you know, which most of them seem to have been. Uh, uh, but interesting and uh, very dramatic. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's an entire project to be done on uh, storm uh, stone circles in storms, um, but this one I rather like. 
now we've we've not seen too much wildlife because it's not uh, particularly um, uh, uh, easy to get uh, nice photos uh, uh, of wildlife. The um, the Wetland Wildlife Trust uh, is an organisation here in Britain that runs a number of uh, wetlands areas and a lot of the migratory uh, species uh, actually uh, use them as a, a stopping off point in their migrations, obviously, and uh, there are a number around the lakes. Uh, there isn't uh, that much on within the Lake District itself, but around the edges, especially in the flatland leading to around towards the sea, there are a lot of these uh, wetland um, uh, preserved areas. Um, and uh, this is one of the Hooper swans coming in, uh, taken from one of the hides on the uh, wetland trust. So that's Scotland. Uh, I was going to ask, are there any questions or Anyone got any uh, thoughts uh, or questions they'd like to share? No? Okay. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do a, a, a brief, uh, the first part of Scotland, and then maybe we can have a, a five, ten minute break for a coffee, and then I'll finish off. Does that make sense to everyone? Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Was that uh, did that material give you a, a flavour? Okay. So, uh, right. So, coming up to Scotland. Okay. So, uh, I have to be careful here. My my other half and her family are all Scottish, so I, I need to be accurate <laughs> with what I say here. So, Scotland is not the same country as England. Uh, it's part of the United Kingdom for sure, but the, the crowns only became the same kingdom in about 1707, I think it was, 1704. Um, so it has a different legal system to England and Wales. Um, Scottish law is not the same as English law. And uh, it, it's uh, strictly speaking, I think still think it has a Scottish pound, although it's the same as the English pound. But anyway, that's that's never I've never quite understood that. But Scotland's a, a huge part of uh, the, the island, but it only has about five and a half million, six million people living in it. So it's one of the places where there's a fair amount of um, um, wild wilderness and a lot of the most dramatic landscape excuse me a minute just let the cat escape um the wilderness um uh landscapes are particularly fine uh around uh, scotland so basically most of the population is in the uh space between glasgow and edinburgh uh in the bottom half the central valley uh, you can see uh, as you go further north, there's a sort of northeast uh, split, the Great Glen that comes down from Inverness uh, down towards the Inner Hebrides, and that's actually a part of a geological fault. I think the north part belongs to a different fault line or a different fault to the, to the rest of Scotland, uh, and that's Loch Ness, uh, with or without Nessie, obviously. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to travel north of the central belt, uh, through Stirling, which was one of the old capitals. Um, and we're going to hit, head towards uh, Glencoe. Um, so, which is really part of the Grampian Mountains. And uh, uh, on the way, you see uh, um, uh, Loch Tula, which is. Uh, uh, Again, you can see that the, the mountains are quite different here. They're pretty bare. There's a lot of these small locks, uh, very flooded uh, uh, ground. Um, and Glencoe, of course, is sort of famous for a, um, a fight between and a betrayal between two clans. Uh, this was part of the contested 
uh, ownership between, the, or sorry, I shouldn't say ownership, the, the contested uh, uh, right for the different clans to uh, ally with different political factions, some with England, some against, etc. Well, partially against, I should say. Um, but Glencoe's the most famous uh, sort of uh, valley in uh, Glen in Scotland in many ways. And this is a typical uh, uh, early winter look. Uh, and you can see it gets a lot of snow. It's pretty dramatic. Um, and again, it's a wonderful place to uh, take images. Uh, the, the valley itself, the Glen, is, is pretty. It's got a, vi a village at the top. Uh, but along the way, you have these old uh, small farmhouses, only three or four of them left. Um, this is Black Rock Cottage, and it's a sort of you know mandatory photograph, I suppose. Uh, but it gives you an impression of just how uh, grim uh, the scene can be. And in fact, historically, the kids in um, Glencoe used to have to have vitamin D supplements because they were getting rickets. Uh, simply because of the village was living in the shadow of the hills so much, they never got any sunshine. Um, now, when you get to Glencoe, you can um, uh, take a, a left turn as you go north and you end up towards heading towards Glen Etive. And this is uh, Bukel Etive. It's one of the mountains on the way into Glen Etive. Uh, it's a beautiful winter shot. Um, that was in winter, same mountain in the autumn. And again, I think this really captures a lot of what uh, Scotland looks like at its best. Uh, uh, dramatic skies, uh, beautiful uh, waterfalls. Oops, sorry. And Glenative, uh, if you go along the, the straggly road into it, it you end up with this uh, lock uh, at the end. Uh, those of you who uh, are fans of uh, James Bond franchise at Glen uh, Ative was where Skyfall was filmed. Um, and it looks better, I think, in uh, uh, some of uh, uh, Ray's photos than it does in, uh, in the film. It's very, uh, very dark on a dark day. Um, and uh, in terms of wildlife, again, you've got a lot of the, uh, the deer and Highland stag. Um, and that, I think, is a Red deer, essentially Glenative. Um, that's a uh, early summer, I think. Um, but again, you can see dusting of snow at the top, still a little bit left, um, and the bracken uh, just turning colour uh, with the deer so well uh, camouflaged behind it. But again, you've got these huge glacial um, valleys, uh, minimal farming. Uh, and a pretty tough way of life, I think. Now, in terms of the birds of prey, um, uh, red kites have been reintroduced and a lot of the, um, the, the other species like the sea eagles are way out in the um, uh, islands on the west, but and uh, a lot of the ospreys are on the far right coast of uh, Scotland, so I haven't covered them here, but that gives you a flavour um pardon the pun um those are the typical uh, birds of prey and uh, that's one of annette's uh, favorite photos i think and as you go through glencoe uh, you get to the top and there's a bridge that connects you as you can see beyond the boat um to the to the rest of the highlands uh but those mountains and the clouds are pretty much uh, a good day uh, you can get all weather, all seasons in one day over at uh, uh, in Glencoe. It's a pretty dramatic uh, place, even without the history. So uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll suggest we just stop for um, a few minutes, uh, grab a coffee if that's okay with everyone. Um, that's and, good. Okay. Uh, so, any questions I can ask, ask, answer quickly at this point? I'm I'm curious about when uh, the areas where you were showing the kind of early fall colors. What what is that season for you typically in those areas? Uh, so the uh, so I would say 
if you if you're there in september september it, you, you you'll get very you'll just start to see them turning october uh, by november it's they've gone it's a very sharp turn so okay. if, if you wanted the best weather really may and september in scotland are fantastic Good. and you don't get very many mosquitoes or midges Just, uh, you there. you were using a term for the ground cover. What was that term? Uh, bracken. Bracken. Is that the yes. word? I was using? Yeah. So it's gorse, and there's a particular plant called bracken, which is um, essentially it dies down over the the winter, uh, springs into uh, green. Sheep can eat it. Deer can eat it. Not much else can. <laughs> um, and then the bracken grows up, and then it dies down into this beautiful orange brown color. As autumn kicks in, um, is it a is it a grass or is it more of a brush? yeah? It's a type. It's it's a ooh, that's a good one. It's it's a very it's a very coarse grass. I'm not sure whether it's strictly a grass, but it it um, it's very springy. Uh, there's gorse mixed in with it, and a, and a few other high uh, high fell plants. It was actually one of the reasons why the Chernobyl uh, disaster in the 80s caused such a problem for the high fells. A lot of those plants actually concentrated the radionucleotides. So when the sheep and the deer ate them, of course, it got concentrated in the flesh, um, which made them uneatable uh, by humans. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, very typical that that sudden shift to the um, the gold, the brown, orangey is sort of uh, uh, our we get more of that than I think a lot of our deciduous trees. I think it's not like New England fall where you get those beautiful colors. Um, it's really covered by the, the, the bracken. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right, a five minute break. Would that be okay, Wonder? Sounds good to me. Okay, uh, take you to a, another part of Scotland. This is uh, uh, the Ardnamurkan I'm sure I haven't pronounced that correctly, uh, Peninsula. Um, we were just at Glencoe, which is uh, just at the bottom middle of this, this map, but the Ardnamurkin Peninsula is the, the most, nor uh, most westerly part of uh, the British mainland, not including the islands, obviously. Um, and the Ardnamurkin area is has for a long time or for many years been a, um, a, a not quite a backwater but a, but a hidden gem um, it's the last remaining uh, uh, temperate rainforest in, in Britain um, and just north of it in a place around where you see uh, Moidart uh, on the map there um, uh, those areas are the, probably the most uh, remote uh, and difficult to live in areas in, in Scotland. They're, they're, they are uh, very isolated um, and very, uh, uh, very wonderful places to visit, but they are very difficult to live in. Uh, our daughter was living there for a while uh, and uh, it um, uh, proved to be quite a challenge. So let's go to the Ardnamurkin Peninsula. Uh, as I said, it's the last um, temperate rainforest in Britain. And you get these, uh, they call them lochens, uh, sort of miniature lochs, lakes. Uh, and this is a typical uh, reflection, rather cliched, unfortunately, but it, it gives you a view of just trees everywhere, uh, water everywhere, um, lily pads. This was uh, uh, early autumn. Um, so we've got a, uh, this gives you a sort of an impression of what the, uh, everything looks like. If you just walk off the pathway, you'll find one of these lochens uh, surrounded by trees, uh, and it's just trees everywhere. Uh, this was the, uh, we had a week of, of almost no rain, uh, which was unheard of, according to the people we were uh, visiting. And you can see here, these are, these are not post-process, these are 
I mean, it was late in the day, so the colours are nice, but everything was green. There's lichen, there's moss, there's six inches of moss on the on the uh, rocks. It was just uh, otherworldly. I, I hadn't realised we still had temperate rainforest. Uh, it's quite an interesting place. And because of its isolation, uh, uh, Ardnamurkin was the place where Bonnie Prince Charlie retreated when he uh, lost his battles to reclaim the throne. So for uh, those of you who have sort of uh, uh, partially heard the story, the, the Stuarts uh, were essentially expelled um, as kings of England and Scot uh, kings of England. Um, uh, and they brought in uh, William of Orange to take over in the, what was called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Basically, uh, England stole all the great ideas from the, the Dutch, imported them and went on to make a roaring success of it, I suppose. Um, but of course, the Stuart uh, line of kings wanted their kingdom back. And uh, in about 1740-odd, the Stuarts, so, landed in Scotland and, and tried to march down uh, to reclaim the throne. And of course, Arden and Merkin was one of the areas, unfortunately for them, where they were very big supporters of the kings. This was driven by religious alignment and uh, blood relations, etc. cetera. Um, and Castle Chorum, which is uh, a ruined Jacobite stronghold uh, in the Arden and Merkin, um, it's on a sea lock. It defends one of the lines of attack if the English had come in by boat. Uh, and in order to prevent the English uh, taking it over, if they had attacked, the local clan ruined his own family home. He burnt it to the ground, basically. Um, so it stands as a monument, I suppose. Uh, and it's quite dramatic. And uh, I always f feel quite uh, affected by it. You know, it's, it takes a lot to destroy your own clan headquarters. Uh, to to march on a on a doomed expedition really, and the Ardnamurkin Peninsula feels very different. It's uh, as I say, it's got a, a temperate rainforest. The land is different, and uh, the patterns of uh, religion and economics are different as well. It's it's quite an otherworldly place. Um, this is the uh, most westerly lighthouse on the mainland Scotland. Uh, uh, in our, at Ardenburg, right at the end, uh, and it's looking out to the inner isles. So uh, you can see rum and egg, uh, of the islands, and, and the, the spiky bit, the sort of the top right, uh, that's the Isle of Skye, which we'll be visiting later. Um, and you can see it better from the top of the lighthouse. This was a, 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 a snap. Uh, I took from the top of the lighthouse, the wind was howling and we went on a tour and uh, we went up the stairs and out the outside and I was the only one who actually went out and when I came back, uh, having sort of basically crawled around the top of the lighthouse, so I don't go out, it's way too dangerous, I only got blown off uh, and of course the, uh, the son of the last lighthouse keeper was laughing his head off as this uh, soft southerner crawling around the top of the lighthouse. It, it was only a gale force. What, what are you complaining about? Um, but it, very beautiful. And people still live on these islands. Um, small communities reached by boat, very isolated. Um, again, some tourism, some fishing, a little bit of uh, agriculture, uh, but a very hard way to make a living. Excuse me. So having sort of looked at Arden uh, we'll visit one of the islands uh, of the Hebrides, Sky. So you can see the Arden Merkin Peninsula uh, at the bottom right. Uh, and if you go north, uh, you hit the Isle of Sky again, uh, a Jacobite Stuart stronghold in the old days. Um, and it's now reached by a, a bridge uh, from the Kyle of Loch Alsh. Um, and you can see at the bottom of the Isle of Skye, you've got the mountains, the Coolins. These are the jagged rocks, uh, mountains that you saw uh, for, on the previous pictures. Um, so on the way uh, to Skye, you see one of the clan uh, castles. Incredibly impressive. It's been there for, you know, since the 1500s, I think, 1600s. Um, 
the clans still use it as a sort of social function and the local landlords own it uh, and maintain control of the agriculture from it but it's uh, essentially a, a heritage site now um, looks nice in the sunshine in the summer it's okay uh, I'm not sure I'd fancy living there in the winter to be honest uh, there's another view of it. Uh, it's at the, at the meeting point of three sea locks, so it's a it's a genuine military control point. Um, and of course, the the local uh, uh, fief uh, sort of the local clans would uh, would war with each other for this, and eventually it became a more civilized uh, economic control rather than military. Um, now, when you get onto the island of Skye, so the, uh, the Kyle of Lokalsh is where the, the bridge spans over to the to the island um, again you get this very dramatic uh, cliff lines um, and this is kilt rock uh, kilt rock is is so called because you can actually see the pattern of a kilt in the rock where you can see it from the distance here um, and again that's just the geological folding and for those of you who are um, interested in the north of scotland the uh, in the 1880s, the north of Scotland was where people first really started to understand deep time and the geological processes that were going on. And uh, a lot of the geological um, work that was done then uh, really led to the understanding of uh, uh, how mountains and rocks formed. And it was really the almost as uh, devastating in, in terms of the depth of change of people's thinking when they understood that the earth was uh, many thousands of years older than they previously thought it to be in the geological processes had created the world that we saw and uh, the northern isles were really one of the main places where that uh, amazing transition and depth of understanding of geology came from um, the far end of sky in east point again you can see these very dramatic uh, cliffs uh, and again, a very typical looking lighthouse. And there's a reason why all these lighthouses, as we'll see in Scotland, look similar, is that they were all built by the father of Robert Louis Stevenson, the, um, the adventure writer, the storyteller. Uh, his father built most of these in the early 1800s. Um, and uh, the, there's a connection uh, to Bristol from here in that the uh, for those of you who remember the story of uh, Treasure Island, the Admiral Benbow Inn uh, was, was modelled on a, a pub uh, of an inn in Bristol, uh, which was pretty disreputable at the time, and it still is, to be honest. Um, uh, but there's, essentially, there's a connection uh, to, uh, uh, through Robert Louis Stevenson to the islands, the, uh, the lighthouses, and back to Bristol, which is, uh, I've always found quite amusing. Now, there's a... a a geological formation on Skye called the Querang. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and it's this amazing set of stacked rocks with some eroding away and some of the harder rock coming through. Again, uh, volcanic. There's a lot of volcanic, uh, ancient volcanoes in this part of Scotland. And some of them, uh, some of the features here are actually uh, eroded magma chambers and, and other geological features. And you can again see the Quarang is, if you get the, the light right, they're pretty dramatic uh, landscapes, very desolate, occasional sheep, but not much else. And that's about it. So as you can see, a lot of the landscapes in the islands are like elsewhere in Scotland, very dependent on tourism, minimal agriculture. Uh, Dunvegan Castle, different clan, other side of the island. Uh, this one's quite nice, actually. Uh, people still live in it. Um, uh, they have apartments in part of the uh, uh, the castle and they've got a beautiful garden uh, behind it uh, with uh, really wonderful um, flowers that they uh, have early um, germinating uh, uh, compared to the rest of Scotland. It's a very nice place to visit. Now you start seeing some of the more jagged parts of the Isle of Skye. These are the, well, the coolins uh, as they're called. Um, and again, the wind whips across these islands most of the year, so you don't get trees very large, mainly because if they do get large, they get cut down. Um, but you have these 
small desolate trees often bent over by the wind and you can see there a small farmhouse in the typical white stone or white painted stone um, nestled in there and it's again very typical view of uh, uh, southern sky um, again locks everywhere rain uh, the geological features mean that you get a lot of these small uh, locken and locks uh, built and this is one of Ray's uh, favorite black and whites um, very typical reeds coming up through very peaceful thing with a smattering of snow on the top and just the rugged mountains around as you can tell the island of skies is one of those places that uh, a lot of the people from the club like to visit um, if you're lucky with the weather uh, and you get up early you get beautiful views like this almost for free um, and so it's almost seems like cheating to be honest uh, it's a very beautiful part of the world um, and Talisker Bay, for those of you who like uh, Scotch whisky, uh, Talisker is one of my favourites. It uh, um, tastes very uh, iodine-y, very strong. It's a bit like cough medicine in a way, I suppose. Um, and this is uh, Talisker Bay just by the uh, um, much more industrial looking uh, distillery. If you look behind where this was taken from, it's not, not a very nice site, but uh, I think this... Uh, is a very beautiful picture of uh, uh, part of what the um, uh, island can look like towards the end of the day with a softer light uh, late in summer. Now, Elgol is a classic thing. If you do go towards the sky, uh, this is Elgol Beach. Uh, it's a very rocky beach, a lot of pools. Uh, and as you can see from this, you can really see the, um, uh, the jagged mountains at the bottom. And this is just around the corner from them. And it's a very typical uh, view, a little cliched maybe, but the Elgol beach is quite dramatic and it looks, uh, looks really wonderful in most lights, actually. Uh, it's uh, well worth a visit. So we've seen uh, Glencoe, which is at the, in the Grampian Mountains. We've seen Arden Merkin, which is a sort of detour for many, but quite an interesting uh, place, very different from the rest of Scotland. Um, the Isle of Skye is relatively uh, manicured or, and sort of uh, mannered compared to some of the outer islands. Uh, and I want to just uh, finish off uh, the tour, as it were, with a sort of a, a trip around Scotland's north coast. Um, you can see just off to the left of here, uh, this is where um, Skye is, just to the south southwest of this um, uh, map you can see the inner sound there we saw one of the pictures earlier um, and Ullapool is a major industrial port uh, which goes out to the uh, other outer Hebrides islands over the Minch as it's called it's about a three-hour trip out to the uh, Isles of uh, Lewis and Harris but I want to take us uh, north of Ullapool up um, towards Cape Roth uh, which is the far northwest. Um, but on the way, I, I'd like to take you to uh, a quite a, a, a magical place. Um, uh, and then we'll carry on across the top of uh, to Duncansby Head, which is unlike everyone says John of Groats is the far north of Scotland. It isn't. Duncansby Head is the far northeast. So we'll see that in a while. Um, but let's go to Sandwood Bay. Um, Sandwood Bay is uh, a very uh, unique place, actually. It's a bit like Arden Merkin. It's, it's not that well known, um, but it's quite a magical place. So when we went, uh, this is the on the way going um, up from Ullapool. Uh, and as you can see, we were on one side of the glen. Uh, the valley and the mist had just filled uh, the, the valley. Uh, this was at about 5 a.m. I think we were running a little late, uh, but the light and the fog and the mist was just amazing. Um, of course, a few minutes later, uh, a bank of cloud rolled in. You can see it behind the sun there. Uh, and again, we got held up because of the um, other road users. And uh, there's a sort of basic rule in Scotland, which is the sheep, if they're on the road, are just as important, if not more so, more so than your car. 
Uh, so there are lots of people who've uh, hit sheep and actually been done um, for driving without due care and attention. So uh, if you are driving in Scotland, watch out for the sheep. Um, they're pretty dumb. But the, on, you walk about uh, six miles uh, to Sandwood Bay from the, part, the end of the road. Um, and you see sites like this. This is uh, a lock which just happened to be on the path, uh, like a mirror mirror. It was uh, quite mystical, uh, quite amazing. And of course, Sandwood Bay itself uh, has this spike of rock at the end, um, long, long beaches, um, and the waves just driving in. Um, it's actually got a huge dune system behind it. Um, and the fog, this is taken maybe two hours after the previous photo, um, a couple of people on the beach, uh, and the fog just rolled in and just obliterated the view. Um, but you can see the dune system, and this goes uh, back about a mile or so. Uh, fascinating um, place. And there are a lot of um, the Scottish folk musicians and uh, a lot of artists who visit Sandwood Bay almost as a retreat. Um, and when you're there, you can't hear, unless there's other people on the beach, because there's no vehicles, there's nothing. To get there, you have to walk everything in. Um, it's very peaceful and all you get is a, a little hint of what it's like to live uh, towards a wilderness area, actually. Some people go in and wild camp, um, but it's a very peaceful and it's uh, absolutely magical. Now, if you go north of um, uh, uh, Sandwood Bay, you, you come to you end up at Cape Roth, which is the far northwest. Now, it's hard to get to Cape Roth, and we couldn't get there because of the COVID restrictions. Um, it's also part of a Ministry of Defence bombing range, I think. Um, so there's only very limited ways you can get in, and they were shut when we went. Uh, but just around the corner, just on the north coast, start of the north coast, there's a place called uh, Dunnet Bay or Sango Bay here. Dunnet. Um, and Sango Bay is famous for these strange rock formations, um, as in fog. And once the fog goes and the sun comes in, you get these amazing, almost like dragon's teeth uh, set in the sand. Um, very strange, just um, quite unusual. Um, almost nothing there. There's scrubby grass on, on the hill above it, a small village uh, campsite, and uh, these small plants struggling uh, to find a foothold on the rocks. And uh, I, I sort of uh, almost remember the, that thing from Jurassic Park, I think it was, where uh, someone says, Life will find a way. And here you have these flowering plants fighting the salt and the, and the uh, waves pounding them in and they're still trying to to make a make a way for themselves uh, on these uh, incredibly uh, hard uh, and unforgiving uh, spaces now if you go further no around uh, of course you um uh, you come close to a village called Doon Ray which was where one of the um uh 1970s what were called fast breeder reactors were, was being built uh, this was uh, in the 70s uh, people were worried about running out of uranium so they were going to breed plutonium uh, to use for fuel and for other reasons um, and so the uh, Doon Ray uh, nuclear power plant was built on the north coast of Scotland um, however uh, they weren't quite as careful as they should have been and uh, one of the local beaches get got contaminated after a uh, someone had dumped a, I think it was about a pound of uh, sodium down a water filled pipe, which uh, then exploded and spread bits of uh, radioactive waste all over the beach. Uh, we got a bit of a shock, actually. We were driving, looking for somewhere to have a picnic, turned in and thought, oh, that looks quite nice. And then we turned around and saw this sign. So um, the relative isolation of the North Coast has its uh, downsides as well as its upsides. Um, and here, as you go along towards Dunnet Head, we're, we're heading across the top of uh, Scotland uh, at this point, and we get to, which is the most northerly point on the mainland, 
Again, you can see a very typical Stevenson style lighthouse uh, pointing the foghorn across the gap between uh, the mainland and uh, the Orkney Islands. And there's the Isle of Hoy uh, across the gap. Um, of course, in uh, the World Wars, the, the Orkneys and the, were where a lot of the fleet was uh, maintained and uh, uh, the, a lot of diving holidays go on up there now. Uh, but it's a pretty bleak and desolate place uh, once the sun uh, disappears. And if you go round to the top of Scotland, right all the way to the northeast, you get to Duncansby uh, Head, um, which is the most far northeasterly point on the mainland. So we've sort of reached the end of a, a journey there. And this is uh, Duncansby Lighthouse at dawn, looking west all the way along the, the north coast. And uh, where we were just on the previous photos is you can just see it poking out above the uh, uh, lighthouse there. Um, this was in September, uh, about 6 a.m. Uh, beautiful light um, and a ferry was just coming in just the extreme right of this, uh, cutting in across uh, from the, uh, the Orkneys. And the Duncansby Sea Stacks, which is the sort of the far, far northeast corner, this is uh, uh, quite a, a famous uh, photo, oh, sorry, place to take photographs. Uh, the only downside is that probably the best place to take photographs is from the beach you can see on the bottom right. But to get to it, you have to scramble down a rope ladder. And uh, at 6 a.m. in the freezing cold, <laughs> Uh, with frost on everything, I sort of was a bit uh, swithery about whether to do it. Uh, and then I realized it wasn't a rope ladder, it was just a piece of rope. The, the other part of the rope ladder had gone, um, at which point I sort of declared uh, victory and ran for, the, ran for the, the car or the van anyway. Um, but it gives you an idea of just uh, how dramatic that coast can be. Um, it's not quite as sort of consistently dramatic. There are a lot of uh, very small, low hills on the way to it. But I hope uh, it's given you a sort of a flavor of the west coast of uh, the mainland islands. Um, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed the tour. Um, I'll stop there and we can have a chat and uh, I can answer any questions. Yeah, Dave, that was just a, a fantastic tour. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, it was it was a real pleasure putting it together, and, and, and the, it was great. And the one, it. yeah, the one picture I, that amazed me was the long exposure at Devon. You had that cormorant. How did you get him to sit so still without moving? Ah, well, I, I, I to be honest, I, I have a huge admiration for a lot of the landscape photographers in the club because they spend. Uh, hours <laughs> waiting for them not to move or to move at the right time and uh, I have a I have a horrible feeling I just don't have the patience for it uh, you know that it's got a hat tip to them because they, they must have they probably tried that five times I would say and uh, what you're seeing is the edited highlights so I don't want to put them down too much but I, I know that uh, Ray and the others will will spend days in a place Going on holiday with them must be a nightmare. I can just imagine, you know, no, 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 we're going to be here all day. But what are you doing? Well, I'm just sitting here, you know, waiting for the light or waiting for the bird to come in the right place. It uh, uh, drives me nuts. I can't do it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. You showed a lot of uh, ruins of castles. Are, are most, most of them in that shape or are there some that are still occupied or open for tourism? I would say it's about 50-50. Yeah. Uh, probably 60-40 occupied. A lot of them are heritage sites, so they've got uh, um, they've got a sort of a uh, they've only just become ruins. I say just, I'd say a few hundred years. So um, a lot of the castles that became ruins more in medieval times were too late to save because basically people stole all the stones to build their villages and houses so there wasn't any way of putting them back yeah. um 
but again it there's there's a two there's two eras i think which um the the civil war um which uh you know at, at school you never really hear too much about it uh, uh but it, it literally tore the, the country apart for four or five years and then cromwell ran pretty well a dictatorship for a few ten years five, three or four years after that and a lot of the the royalist power bases like raglan castle they were just stripped um then henry the eighth's demolition of the abbeys took took another chunk of the the heritage castles away yeah. right you know anything that was a had an abbey attached to a castle they took the whole thing um uh and then of course there's the original medieval pretty ugly fights that went on uh 12 13 1400 as the english and scots had a go at each other ad nauseum um because of course it was always the french and the scots versus the english the old alliance and it's you can see the history through the castles and the rest um but i found it quite fascinating just how um how quickly some of them disappeared into other people's buildings yeah you know these huge stones just got moved mysteriously overnight well okay over 10 20 years i would guess really um but yeah a lot of them are still there i mean the, the interesting ones uh, especially in scotland uh they were still clan chieftain local econ economic drivers until probably victorian times uh, so they're in good shape um, and some of them are really fascinating uh, with very good uh, materials some of them are a little pure touristy and a bit tacky um, but it's worth a worth a visit for a lot of them yeah well great presentation i'm glad you shared a number of images of isle of sky i've always been fascinated by uh photos i've seen of that place so yes thank yeah. you yeah no no i mean the sky is um in the 60s it became the uh place to go for all the uh rock and pop stars who'd made their money yeah uh, in england they all went and bought estates in sky and and sort of uh in between uh sort of world tours or whatever tried to turn themselves into local gentry um it's quite mannered in places it's it's both dramatic and very civilized you know it's fairly built up in some places um if you go to the outer hebrides the uists and the lewis and harris i didn't have time to share that today they are really wild i mean harris is it's called the isle of rust because basically when a car stops working, they just leave it to rust in the fields. I mean, it, it's really wild. Um, uh, and I wouldn't like to live there in the winter, I have to say. <laughs> My wife's uncle lives in the Isle of uh, uh, Harris, uh, of Lewis, um, and he loves it. Um, but it's a pretty wild place. Uh, it's good fun, good fun. Um, Thank you for the kind comments that just came through. Um, are there any other questions or pointers I can help with? Well, I just I just want to say I enjoyed this tremendously, and it was well oh, worth inside on a nice day. And yeah, yeah, I do. I, I was I I sped up a little bit towards the end, given that I know that you guys are in the middle of a sunny day, which isn't that common at the, this time of year for you. Oh, I, it's got me. Your your presentation has me wanting to visit and uh, so brilliant yeah yeah very much so yeah great and, and again for me one of the, the really interesting things is um the the cultural threads that run through the places i mean it's it's not like many landscapes where you know there's five thousand years of manicuring and, and maintenance being done uh, through multiple uh uh, eras of revolution, agricultural, political, everything. And it really shows in the landscapes. Um, uh, I mean, Scotland shouldn't look like it does. It should be a, it should be woods, mm. right? Um, and it's all because people decided that sheep were more important than people in the 1800s. So, you know, there's a lot of political threads that run through the history. Um, but I do quite like Cornwall as well because it's. Uh, 
I just love the idea of the majority of the French brandy being imported into England came through illicit smuggling through Cornwall with the help of a lot of the local priests and others who were taking a cut. So it all seemed, it just seems quite otherworldly, uh, but uh, fascinating anyway. So thank you. No, thank you for the comments. I hope it was of interest. And uh, um, if you do get a chance to come over, always do feel free to drop me a line and we'll uh, see what we can do about providing pointers and uh, guidance. All right. Well, thank you. And to all of the photographers who contributed, I'm sure that was a big project putting it together. But it was good fun. And uh, a lot of people were very, very keen to do so. And uh, I'll pass on your thanks to all of them. I just want to say thank you for um, including the political and cultural and the geological aspects in, in this talk to that. Yeah, um, no, no, very welcome. It's, uh, uh, it, it's a very um, the storytelling behind the landscape I find increasingly fascinating. Um, the, uh, there are whole projects on just slate mining in Snowdonia. You know, people have dedicated their lives to telling the story of that. And uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating area. But as you say, we, you know, it's 5,000 years of, of people uh, working the land and, and controlling it. So there's a lot of stories. Um, but if you have any particular topics or things you, you're interested in, do feel free to drop me a note. I'll, I can always do some digging for you. And uh, uh, some of this poetry, in particular from Scotland, about the more wilderness areas like Noidart and Asint up in the Highlands, uh, there's a lot of uh, very interesting uh, uh, literary work that's been done around there. So. I'll pass on your thanks. And uh, Jules, I hope that's uh, whetted your appetite. And uh, uh... Yes, <clears throat> Jules, you're muted. Yep. Thank you again. No, you're welcome. Uh, very happy. And uh, uh, if there are any particular areas you'd like, I can see if there's any other people in the club who want to share some more images as well. So uh, do keep in touch and uh, thank you for all your kind comments. You all have a good weekend. Yeah, enjoy Thank the you. sunshine. Take <laughs> care. <laughs> Thank you.